Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law's Educational Forum's presentation of A Question of Law. Today we're in Middleton and we're going to go inside and take a look at prison life. Joining me will be Sheriff Frank Cousins, who will discuss some issues concerning the prison. And then after that, we'll be joined by Captain Jason E. Basher of the Sheriff's Department, who will give us a tour of the facility. Let's go talk to Sheriff Cousins. Our average prisoner, uh, a sentence inmate, someone who is sentenced to county time, is uh, an average inmate would be age of about 24 years old. The average sentence is seven to nine months. And 70% uh, of the people that are committed here are committed for drug or alcohol related crimes. And 90% of those people have um, substance abuse or alcohol related uh, addictions. Now, is it likely as well that this is not their first uh, foray into the criminal arena that they had previously uh, committed some criminal acts? Yes, um, most uh, people have either been on some type of uh, probation or parole or some type of continue without a finding, have been involved in the court system in some way and have been sentenced to us. Um, so traditionally someone's life is probably unraveled for three or five years before that. Is the average age at the mid-twenties, is that typical of the, the prisoner we would find for the most part in the United States? It's getting uh, a lot younger. Um, for example, in Massachusetts right now there's probably a total of um, 12,000 people incarcerated in the county systems, about 9,000 in the DOC, and uh, the average age is getting younger and younger. And I heard an interesting statistic the other night um, from Frank Carney on the Sentencing Commission who had done some uh, reviews in terms of uh, ages and population. If you went back, uh, let's say, uh, in the late 60s, there were probably about 3,800 people incarcerated in the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts and it was a lot older population. Hmm. Uh, what, on a day-to-day -day basis, what does a prisoner do, for instance, with respect to their drug issues? Are there, are there drug education programs? Yeah, we, ha we rely a lot on, on a lot of programs. Um, we, we try to structure someone's day just like they're in a halfway house or some type of a, a, or, or an alternative school because we think it's important to keep their minds occupied and more importantly for them to work on um, their issues of why they're incarcerated and to clearly not to have them come back into jail. So, so an average person that's in a SACO unit or in a batterers unit um, gets a structured time when they get up, um, when they've got uh, their group uh, sessions or their one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, or when they can go to the library, when their meals, and in their free time that they have at night uh, visits. So everything is pretty structured for them and it, and it works out well that way. And what, what time actually do they start each day? Um, in the um, sentenced inmates that are in the program areas will be getting up around 645. Uh, at some point they go to classes and the like and then do, do many of them work as well? Um, we have some people that work here at the prison. We have probably about 65 sentenced inmates that actually have jobs assigned to them either in um, maintenance, cleaning, uh, we have about 40 that work in the kitchen, you know, we have a culinary arts uh, program there. We also have people that work in the programs building. Now, some prisons actually have the prisoners work for, uh, on a profit basis, to have them making uh, goods or s doing services where they can actually charge the community for those uh, types of services. We, we don't do that because we really don't have enough time to have someone here at the county stay. Um, we do do some community service in our print shop for senior citizens groups, uh, printing for cities and towns um, that the inmates will work up there in the print shop. But our main focus is um, on a very quick turnaround to identify um, what drug or alcohol issues, if someone needs a GED, and really to focus on the whole reentry initiative from point of impact. So when someone comes in the door here, they're immediately sitting down with someone and we're talking about why and what are the underlying causes that's creating um, this type of behavior and they're coming into jail. Now what's the end of the prisoner's day like? I mean, do they get to watch TV? Do they have to go in uh, uh, to bed we, at a certain time? Yep, yeah, we do. We have um, put everybody into bed just a little before 10 o'clock. Um, the uh, program areas um, have some free time at the end of the day to watch TV or clear if there's a sporting event on. Um, but um, we do have a lot of outside NA and AA meetings that come into the institution um, in the evening, so we have a lot of participation with that. Um, but we try to keep it very, very structured. 
Now, uh, if they behave themselves, do they get additional privileges? And conversely, if they misbehave, do they lose free time, privileges, TV, things like that? Yes. Um, we have a D-board system where um, inmates can be disciplined for things that they do wrong, um, you know, not following directions from a correctional officer, uh, maybe some type of, uh, you know, any type of altercation with another inmate or even with a correctional officer. Um, we have a disciplinary police where you can take things away. You can take visits away. Um, the privilege of going to the library, the privilege of going to the gym or playing basketball outside or just being in a program, you know, and uh, everything is driven by privilege. And one of the privileges would be the access to a law library, I would guess, so that they can pursue whatever appeals and the like they have? Yeah, we have a, a great uh, law library. We have a, a librarian that works um, full time. And um, going to the library is clearly a, a privilege, you know, to use the law library or get any other type of um, reading material or working on your GED. But um, really, where it's like that, we have very few problems in the, in the library. <laughs> um, on a cost basis, what is the what is the typical cost one would expect to see to house an inmate on an annual basis? Our average cost here is just a little bit over twenty six thousand dollars per year per inmate. So if you multiply that out by uh, a little bit over uh, almost 1,700 inmates, you'll, you'll come up with our total budget cost. But it's about $26,000. Uh, the DOC is about $44,000, $45,000 uh, to incarcerate someone in the state prison system. Now, would that be, does the cost uh, uh, end up increasing depending on the level of the, the, that the facility actually has? For instance, it would a halfway house or a transitional that's uh, correct. There would place be, be less? less money. Um, clearly, you know, ours is $26,000, but I mean, if you have someone in type, some type of an alternative center, a halfway house, a group home, uh, a pre-release setting, you know, the lower the, the level of classification, the cost is going to uh, decrease. Now, some suggest that for-profit prisons perhaps are a way to go in the future because they can do it somehow for less and do it better than uh, the state or the federal government can operate its prisons. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that, you know, there's some core functions that I believe the government should be providing for, for our citizens. And clearly, um, we get into the area of public safety, prisons, policing, courts, uh, judicial. Those are the functions I think that government should be providing for our citizens. Uh, I'm not a, an advocate of, you know, privatizing private prisons. Um, we've looked at some of those things, you know, other states do it, and they're not always as successful as um, people think, you know, uh, clearly uh, in terms of, you know, the level of accreditation that a prison might have, um, the quality of a person you try to hire to be a correctional officer. Um, you know, we bring in people to become correctional officers that work second or third shift here. They start on the job now that are making almost $45,000 a year to start, so it's a very good paying job. Um, and we think that um, there are things that we can privatize within our existing system. For example, medical care. We, we don't, we privatize that to a, 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 nation, a national company that provides health care in all sorts of prisons across the United States. We have very good luck with that. The cost is better. The liability issues are better. I'm not hiring nurses and doctors, um, medication costs. So that is an advantage. Um, also, the inmate canteen, where inmates can buy a candy bar, a tonic, or some commissary items, we privatize that as opposed to us stocking all of that inventory and, and having to, you know, pretty much run a small general store or a small uh, commissary or department store. So there are some things you can privatize, but um, those are the things that we have done that have been cost effective. Um, and I, I don't see the um, pr privatizing of proven services being as something that's working across our country. How successful are we in general with our prisoners and making sure that they don't uh, end up back in the same position two or three or five years later? Well, I, I don't think we're really that successful. I think that we're, we're starting to get there. You know, I've been uh, a strong advocate of uh, programs and changing inmates' behavior while they're incarcerated uh, since I came here nine years ago. Um, clearly, um, the buzzword you hear in the business now is reentry. How do you prepare someone to reenter society? Is there some type of accountability piece? Is there supervision? Is there drug testing and drug treatment on demand? So those things we've been at the forefront in our county. Um, we have uh, three community correction centers. We work with probation and parole on to provide those services when people get released from jail. 
Um, I think the rest of the country uh, is clearly uh, behind us. A lot of the other counties within our Commonwealth are starting to head in this direction. Um, there's no question that we cannot build our way out of the, you know, this prison inmate population problem that we have in the United States. What are some of the best practices you would see that uh, ensure that the prisoners don't return in a year or ever? Well, I think best practices that we've identified that work here um, will be um, starting reentry at point of impact when someone comes into jail. Um, doing an assessment of an individual and really looking and understanding what is the underlying issue of his criminal behavior. Then putting a uh, structured treatment plan in place to correct that behavior. Have that plan follow him throughout his incarceration. Have a step down piece where someone can step down to like a Lawrence Correctional Alternative Center where you can reintegrate them in doing community service, um, maybe taking them to uh, some type of 12-step meetings in the program. Having community police offices and cities and towns, probation and parole, involved in the process when someone is being released from jail, which we do. So people know who's coming back to their communities. Do victim notification. And then have individuals that are, uh, like in our reentry center up at the Lawrence Farm, then have them go to some type of a step down or halfway house program. Those are the people that do the best. You're not going to save everybody, but your success rate will be a lot higher. Um, the other thing which I think is uh, important, which the legislators are looking at, is this whole issue of post-release supervision. So you can make sure that someone is involved in drug treatment and drug testing. How, if the uh, drug use is so prevalent when they come in here, is, are drugs used in prison to a large extent? As drugs well? are used in prison. We drug test people here in prison on a weekly uh, basis between parole, probation, the House of Correction, the farm, our community alternative centers, um, our electronic morning. We drug test over 1,300 people. And we find people that still, you know, being addicted to a drug or an alcohol, it's, it's, a, it's a very time-consuming process to wean someone off of that and change their behavior. Um, there's a lot of talk about that presently now, how it's affecting our schools and our young people. And, uh, and I believe that is the major public policy issue that is um, hurting our schools and young people in our county. And we talked one time before about the fact that it, it, you don't allow um, uh, touching or access between visitors and prisoners to try and ensure that, at least in some ways, that that uh, path to getting uh, contraband into the prison is is also eliminated. Yeah, we work very hard on that. It's you know it's a you know it's human nature as you know. Um, we don't allow contact visits here in Middleton. That clearly helps us um, by not having that contact. Um, but it's a, it's an ongoing issue, and uh, we work very hard on it. Do, does the do the visits themselves are they part of the process to try and and in, ensure that the prisoner can at some point return to a level in society where he's got support around him? Visits are very important. You know, we find that uh, for males, uh, it works very well. And again, it's a privilege to have someone come visit someone in prison. So um, we have visits seven days a week. And more importantly, that helps the, uh, the climate in the prison, you know, in terms of, you know, how people feel about themselves if they get to see a mother or a father or a wife or a loved one. And we find that to be very helpful. We do notice that with our women that we have incarcerated up in Salisbury, at our pre-release facility, uh, a few less visits. It's, not, uh, it's clearly a gender issue where you, you don't get as many males going and visiting uh, women in jail. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. The women are, are more considerate than the men, again, I guess. Yeah, they are. You know, it's very interesting. It's something that we've noticed here. How realistic is the portrayal we see in television and at the movies with respect to prisoner violence and sexual assaults and the like? Well, prisoner violence can happen. We, we pride ourselves in not having prisoner violence, but, um, you know, it, we do have fights. Um, sometimes we'll go two or three weeks without an altercation, but they do come. Um, one thing that has helped us in the prison here, and I talked about it with uh, Commissioner Kathy uh, Dennehy and her associate commissioner, Ron Duval, who used to be the superintendent at Walpole State Prison, back in 1997, we put cameras in here, and we've since updated our system. But um, that helps a lot to eliminate prison violence. You know, people, inmates that want to assault officers. Uh, it also helps protect officers who an inmate might say an officer used too much force. And, you know, again, 
it, uh, it shows that the officer is doing his job and he or she is doing his job and, and that's a great tool to diffuse things. So that type of stuff helps us um, tremendously here um, to cut down on it. It does happen. We are in an environment where what we say we're managing risks, where we're dealing with um, people that traditionally have had problems. We try to keep uh, sexual predators separated from each other, um, but sometimes, um, you know, we do have situations where um, there is, um, you know, someone might try to sexually assault someone or do something that they shouldn't do. And we've charged them. And, uh, you know, you just do the best you can, but those things do happen. Yeah, the last numbers I saw from a study in the Midwest said about 3% of the prisoners suffer some form of inmate violence during um, their incarceration. Is that high or low, would you think, that number is in, as a general matter? I think that's, you know, a pretty fair snapshot of what would go on here. If you figure maybe uh, 2 to 3%. Uh, when I first came here, there were a lot of, there was a lot of uh, violence and a lot of fights. But I think a lot of that has to do with the staff. You know, if you've got a good staff that, you know, have set down some rules and regulations, there's some policies in place, you have a fair inmate grievance procedure where you're objectively looking at it. So if an inmate complains about something, that gets addressed and gets answered, and you can kind of cut down on uh, some of the tension. But um, I think that's a fair, a fair number. Well, even if it is as low as 3 to 5 percent, that actually is, in my mind, a lot less than what we see portrayed on television and the movies. I mean, it's, uh, I've always thought about if, if I were to go to prison, I'd, I'd want to be in solitary because I prefer not to, to, to associate with anyone else. Is solitary as bad as, as, it, as, as that portrayal is, that people well, go crazy because they're by themselves? I mean, do they I mean, need each other? Sometimes, unfortunately, you have people in society that have to be separated and you know, have to be put into a segregation unit for 23 hours a day and be locked down. Um, we try not to have a lot of people in our segregation unit. Um, we try to classify people that commit like crimes, and, and that works very well. I mean, you get in our drug and alcohol units where we have 160 beds, the bulk of the people there have been, you know, involved in a motor vehicle homicide, driving under the influence multiple times, possession of drugs in the school zone. So you get that group together and you start working with that group cohesively to, to break down um, their issues. Uh, unfortunately, then you get into the issue of domestic violence. We put that group together, alternative violence unit, and you work with them. Um, but in the administrative seg unit, you have any time from 35 to 45 people that are consistently um, going to be incarcerated. And I think the easiest way to look at that is, remember I said at the beginning of the show, is where we have presently now in Massachusetts 12,000 people locked up in the county system, 9,000 in DOC. So you get about 21,000 people incarcerated. Then if you go back to what Frank Carney talked about on the Sentencing Commission, um, back in the 60s, and you looked at, combined, we had about 3,600 people incarcerated in our state. So you, then you take and you look at that number, and you say, well, you know, we get back to that theory of 90% of the people that come into jail would not have been here if they're not involved in drugs and alcohol. So if you focus in on them, you can kind of, you know, you categorize your numbers, and you can look at traditionally that percentage of people that are um, going to be in jail in a, in, a, in a society like ours, and you, you know, segregate them, and you put them over in a housing unit together, or you put, you know, people that are involved in maybe gang activity or just some type of a strong island of violence, and you put them together, and you deal with them in that form. And I think that's what you're seeing most prisons do today. Yeah, shortly, we're going to take a tour of the of the prison. But when I was here before, I did notice that there are actually separate buildings, separate pods. Mm -hmm. Is that more the modern approach to really try and have smaller units, both from a standpoint of classifying prisoners as well as from a standpoint of being able to control smaller groups of prisoners? Yeah, it, it makes a big difference. I mean, we have a, a campus-style dormitory here. Um, you get a smaller pod, you're going to have the most you're going to have is 120 people. You'll have 60 cells, two to a cell. So you can lock that unit right down. If there's a disturbance upstairs in another housing unit, they might not even hear it. Um, so the kind of the old three or four decker tier uh, prisons have become obsolete. Cost is certainly a fact. I mean, you look at Walpole State Prison, you know, which houses about 650 of the most difficult prisons in the Commonwealth, is a three tier 
um, 50 style prison with a, a wall around it. You know, to build that prison in real money today would probably be close to $350 million. Mm -hmm. You can build a lot of schools for that. Mm -hmm. So this, this, op this operation here to, to build something like this today would probably be, be about 90 to $100 million, you know, with the fencing and the, the, the units that way. So cost drives a lot of that in terms of how we classify people, how we're going to manage our population. And one last myth before we leave and take our tour, um, the prison escape. Uh, you tend to see that in the movies and on television and the like, that they're either tunneling under or somehow escaping. Is that, that's not really a realistic portrayal no, either, is it? We knock on wood when we talk about that. We've been very fortunate. Our staff does a great job. We've never had anybody um, escape from here in Middleton. We're very cognizant of that every day. You have to, you know, you count and you got to watch people. Um, but, you know, that's why they call them cons, because they're trying to sometimes think of ways to get out. Um, at our pre-release facility up in Lawrence, we probably have an average of four or five people that will walk away a year. But it's an unwalled uh, pre-release facility, and if they do that, they'll never go back to that facility, any pre-release facility in the Commonwealth. Um, they'll get charged and spend extra time in jail. So um, we don't like to have, uh, you know, prison riots, altercations, or escapes. Those are the the three things that, uh, you know, you work hard to diffuse. Well, we're all in agreement on that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sheriff. Okay, thank you. We now need to take a brief break. When we come back, we'll take a tour of the prison and see how the prisoners live on a day-to-day -day basis. Please return with us in a few moments. Every time an adult gives up on our kids, Every time we surrender to the belief that their future is out of our hands, another child is left behind. I'm General Colin Powell, and I don't believe in giving up. That's why I'm asking you to join America's Promise. Log on to americaspromise.org or give us a call. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you can do something important. Pull your weight. They won't leave you for someone younger. They won't notice you've gained weight. They won't fire you. They won't talk about you behind your back. All they'll ever do is love you. Find the love of your life. Visit PetFinder at ASPCA.org. Phone's taken. Son, will this help you? Maybe the last thing you would do for somebody should be the first. Thanks. Hey, I appreciate it. A message from the Credit Union Foundation and your hometown credit union. Welcome back to A Question of Law. We're here with Jason E. Basher, and he's going to give us a tour of the facility today. So come join us. Okay, welcome to the Essex County Sheriff's Department, uh, Middleton facility. My name is Jason E. Basher, I'm a captain. Uh, to start our tour, we started Central Control. Central Control is not on camera right now, it can't be taped. However, it's the brain of the facility. All communication, all radio communication, all telephone communications starts with central control. In addition to that, all emergencies that happen within the facility start with central control. For instance, if there's an emergency in the facility, 
then they notify central control and they, they notify the appropriate parties to respond to the situation, whether it's a response team that's within inside the jail or the fire department outside the jail as well. In addition to that, all fire alarms will sound inside central control as well. As far as uh, if there's a fire within the facility, then the fire department will respond. And also all background checks, what we call BOPs, um, will be checked as well before anybody enters the facility, any visitors. In addition to that, transportation is run out of central control where all inmates that are transported to and from court will be, brought, uh, will be, will be set up, organized within central control. And they'll determine what vans go to what courts without the, throughout the, the county and the state. We also go to federal courts outside the state as well. Jason, we're in an area now that I guess is called the pedestrian sally port, which is what looks like two 20-foot high sections of fence covered by razor wire, and then another much more covered area of razor wire as well. Have you ever had anyone get into this area and actually make it to the second fence? We had one occasion where one inmate did climb over one of the fences. Um, by the time he got over the first fence, he was so bloody and beaten that uh, he just gave up and he climbed back over the fence. Uh, that inmate was severely injured from the razor wire. Um, but we have never had an inmate escape from this facility. Um, it's just too difficult as far as that, that one, in, one inmate. Uh, he just had enough. It was too tough. And to make it over three of these fences is, to me, almost impossible. Now, the traffic behind us, or it looks like the traffic to come in and out of the facility moves through that gate there. How does that function? Basically, one gate is open at a time. Uh, both gates should not be open at the same time. All inmates that are transported to and from court or any, any inmate that's coming to this facility or leaving this facility for whatever reason goes through the vehicle sally ports here. And when they go through, one gate will open, the vehicle comes in, the vehicle is then checked for weapons, uh, they open the hood, they open the trunk, they check underneath the uh, vehicle with a mirror, the officer will go around, and no weapons will enter. Uh, past the second gate. So all the weapons have to be checked into the gun locker prior to any officer coming to the side. So even, even the officer's own weapons are not allowed to Correct. come into the facility? Correct. We have no weapons. As correctional officers, we have no weapons at all when we're inside. The only weapons we have is uh, verbal commands. We're not allowed to carry batons, any OC spray, any guns, what have you. And to be honest with you, as an officer, I would rather not have a weapon on a unit because on a unit you have two officers, as we'll see later in the tour, to 120 inmates and it would be very easy for them to take that weapon off me and use it against me, so I'd rather not have a weapon inside. Hi, I'm Diane Sullivan. I'm here with Oscar and Sergeant Gary, and your last name? Mr. Angelo. All right, that's a tough uh, one. Tell us a little bit about Oscar and how he's used here at the facility. Okay, well, Oscar is one of uh, the 17 dogs employed by the department, the canine unit. Um, uh, the 17 dogs we have, uh, we're, we're considered a canine unit by meaning myself and the dog is a canine unit. We are trained and certified by the Boston Police. We go through a 14-week academy. Um, the dogs that we get, they're all... Okay, he's getting excited. The dogs that we get, they're imported from Buffalo, New York, where they come from either Germany or Czechoslovakia. Um, when we get those dogs and they're selected and they go through the training, our main function is working here at this facility. Um, we provide security inside and the outside of this facility. Um, on the average, about 1,100 inmates are incarcerated here. So. By keeping the dogs inside here, we provide security when the inmates um, are out moving about and going to different units, um, going from one program to the next. Uh, we'll provide backup to the officers when they're outside watching the inmates or um, working in the housing units. Basically, um, as a backup in case there are any problems, um, we're here to provide that support. Um, the dogs aren't in here to antagonize or intimidate anyone. We're just here basically to, to oversee everything and make sure there's no problems. Um, if a serious problem does arise inside the, the facility, we are here to respond and provide that backup security with the dog. Um, just by the presence alone with the dog being inside this facility, it's, it's going to stop a lot of problems that might arise um, with a lot of fights and uh, serious incidents like that. It will, um, it will quell those problems. And by being in here, just that mutual support, it's just going to make it that much safer for being inside here uh, for the, if a for the fight officers. If were to break out, what mm -hmm. would um, Oscar be trained to do? Oscar's is training right now. He's considered a patrol dog. He's trained in tracking, building search, area searches, um, articles, and things like that. But when it comes in here, he's, his other training would be crowd control. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be the main function. Uh, dogs are also trained for narcotics. He's not trained yet. He's uh, new. He just certified March 30th with the Boston Police. He will be going through narcotics training. But talking in reference to the other dogs that have that training, 
and the dogs are trained for narcotics, we'll be able to use those in the facility um, to search for narcotics um, in a cell or something like that. Mm -hmm. But quickly, any problems are gonna, that might arise in there, we're going to be in there for the immediate safety of the officers and the inmates, any other inmates that might be um, in threat of their uh, safety. Um, so we're going to go in there and oversee and make sure there's no problems. And hopefully we don't want to use a dog if we don't have to. Just right. by our presence alone, responding to that unit, they're going to see the dog and they, that's, that's going to put enough common sense into them to, to lock into their cells so we can respond to the immediate problem that's, uh, to, that's arisen inside that unit and take care of that and hopefully just get everyone out of there and stop the problem with um, everyone getting out of there safely. Is he trained to protect you? He is trained in handle protection. He's, yep, he's trained. Uh, if anyone gets within a certain distance of me, he will respond. These dogs are actually smart enough to know the difference between an inmate and an officer. Um, they're very, very smart. They can figure that out. The inmates tend to act differently when they see the dogs in here, but they know to keep a certain distance from the dogs. They're told mm -hmm. that when they, when they first come into the facility, so they know that. Um, but if they perceive a threat uh, at the officer, myself, the handler, or another officer, they will react um, by barking and acting in an aggressive manner. But we're not going to send the dog close enough to someone where they're going to bite someone inadvertently and cause any liability. Um, the dog will always be on leash. Our dogs are double, double collared at all times for safety in case one comes off. So we're, the dogs are always in immediate control of us. You can see he's always watching uh, to see what's going on. He's always observant. And they just figure that out being in here day in and day out. They know the difference. They're smart enough to um, incorporate that into their uh, daily routine. I thought my dogs were smart, but now, you know, now I'm not so sure. Last question I have for you. Tell us a little bit about Oscar's life when he's not working here at the facility. Certainly. Officer, he's, uh, he's a big puppy now, that's why he's starting to do that. Um, just like a, basically a person, um, when the dogs, when Oscar goes to work, that's his work time. Basically, whatever my schedule is, he has the same schedule. When our work shift is over, we're assigned our own vehicles. The dogs go home with us. They live with us, the, fam the handler, the family. Um, when they go home, that's his downtime. Um, he's not at work anymore. When I take my uniform off and put everything away, take his collars off, he knows now that's his downtime. He'll spend the time when he goes home in his kennel. Basically, he'll relax, and that's where he'll spend his time. And the kennel inside and outside, it depends on each handle, but we all have a kennels at the house. <laughs> Oscar Fus, turn the other way. Boy. Um, and your command was in what language? My command with him is German. He's from Germany. But basically, that's his downtime. He, we, don't, we don't do any work with him. Um, we we'll play in the yard or something like that with him for a while, but he'll spend a lot of time in the kennel and that'll be his downtime and we don't do any work with him. And when it comes back to work again, he'll just go to work and now he'll be a work dog. It basically just makes him a better well-rounded dog if he has that downtime because you don't want to work with him 24 hours a day. Um, he needs that time to rest and basically interact with the family. It's, it's, it's good too. And if you have other animals, maybe another dog because they are a pack animal. You spend time with the other animals at home. And Jason and, tells me he's considered here an officer? Yes, actually by state law, um, Massachusetts or any other state thereafter, um, a trained and certified canine is a sworn officer, whether it's a he'd be sworn deputy sheriff, um, a police dog would be a sworn police officer under the law. So if someone was to antagonize, assault, intimidate, um, or do anything to one of these dogs, it would, it would be an arrestable offense mm -hmm. under the law. Um, that rarely <laughs> happens. Getting all excited. So, Time to go, I think, huh? But that's a way of covering the department and covering the <laughs> Hi, we're here now with Gail Piccolomini, an MSL graduate and attorney appointed to represent a number of the prisoners here. Uh, Gail, as a female, what is it like to come into a secu high security prison like this to represent clients? Well, my first opportunity to meet these clients are in a um, courthouse. And then I come back, usually we set a trial date or a date further um, to appear in court 30 days. So I like to come to the prison to interview them, to find out their status and what they're really um, here for in the background of their cases. When I come in, I find the clients to be um, very cooperative. They're very um, appreciative that their attorney took the time to come see them. They do give me a lot of background and a lot of interesting um, analysis of toward the case and where the case wants to, what, where they want to progress with the case. And I feel actually quite comfortable with my clients. Now the sheriff told us that uh, more often than not, these folks are here as a result of some uh, either drug or alcohol abuse uh, issues. Uh, do you find that that is in fact the case with your clients? Yes, I find a lot of them do have issues in them. The results of the um, abuse, they find themselves in trouble with the law. 
Now, is it is it the the fact that they actually do have other activities here that they can try to make sure that they don't come back here? I mean, from a standpoint of education or from a standpoint of uh, learning a trade and things along those lines? Yes, they do, and a lot of my clients try to get their GED because they're younger or they, they um, quit school at an early age, but they do have, especially ones that are incarcerated longer, will try to get into the programs here. Now, the sheriff had said that as a general matter, the uh, prison population is getting younger. Are your clients typical of that, of, of that new demographic? Um, well, today I had three different ages. I had a 20, a 30, and a 50, so I'd say the average was probably 30. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much. Now we're in intake. Whenever an inmate first comes in the facility, they come to intake. Intake is the booking area. When an inmate first comes in, they come in through the back door, which is behind us. We'll show you that in a minute. And they come to these one of these chairs to an officer that will be sitting at the, one of these tables here. And they'll get all their information, their date of birth, where they live, why they're in jail, or what have you. And they get all the information in the system. And we take a picture of them, and then we go into one of the tanks over here, which we'll go to next. Once an inmate's been booked, the next thing is they, 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 they take a shower, we give them a uniform, and then they go into one of these tanks here. This is tank five. This is one of our biggest tanks. There have been times we've had probably up to 75 inmates, to over 50 inmates in these tanks before. Um, we have cameras in all these tanks, as you can see in the corners, one over there and one over there. Uh, that's monitored by central control, which was the, the first area that I explained about earlier. Uh, we've had a lot of situations in these tanks before. We've had fights break out. It's a very, very dangerous area where we cram a lot of inmates to a small area. Uh, there's no central here. It gets hot in here as well. Um, it's very dangerous, like I said. And over here, I'll, this is the bathroom here. There's no, there's no stall. If an inmate has to use the bathroom and you get 50 inmates in there, that's what they have to use. In addition to this tank, we have four of the smaller tanks. And in the morning, when transportation gets ready to take the inmates to court, they separate them by tanks. So for instance, in tank one, you'd have Lynn District Court. Tank two, you'd have Lawrence District Court. Tank three, you'd have Salem Superior. Um, but they'd all start in tank five. The officer then comes to the door and ca starts calling out the inmates by court. So Lawrence District Court, go to tank one. Lynn District Court, go to tank two. And that's how it all starts in the morning, Monday through Friday. Currently, we're in the 240 building. The 240 building has four individual units, the A, B, C, and D. Each unit has 120 inmates, and each unit on each unit, they have six security cameras. And here we're looking at a monitor for the 240A, the 240 lower, excuse me. And each, you can, if you click on, you can click on each camera and you can get a better view of what's going on in the unit. Each unit, like I mentioned, said before, has security cameras. These units here, the A and the B, each have six, and we're able to view, the officers in charge are able to view what's going on in each unit if they so choose. Cool. Currently, we're in the uh, 240A. 240A is the uh, at-risk unit. It's a protective custody unit. Basically, inmates that that uh, have issues with other inmates that have safety concerns. Inmates that have charges as far as uh, uh, sexual assaults, uh, child molestation, what have you. Uh, they're in this unit here. Um, you have 120 inmates in this block. You have 60 cells, two inmates to a unit. Uh, this unit here. As I mentioned, it's at risk, which means that they can't leave the unit because they're, they're at risk. They'll be harmed by other inmates within the facility that are in general population. Over here, you have the inmate showers. Um, this is where they shower. They get, uh, you know, by law, they're allowed to get three showers a week. But on this unit here, they take more. This here is the officer's podium. This is where the officer's working station is on the unit itself. You have the computer here where they actually, it's the, everything is done on the computer now as far as log logging in, in, inmates in and out of the unit or staff like ourselves walking onto the unit as well will be logged into the computer. You get the phones and right here is the control panel where the officers have access to open every door within the unit. In addition to that, there's a panel upstairs in the control room so if we ever had a situation like a riot or something that happened on the unit, they could actually turn the panel off upstairs. That way the inmates can't come to this panel and open the doors themselves. We have had situations where the inmates have opened the doors when the officers were busy doing something else. So that gives us access upstairs to turn the panel off. That way we can avoid situations like that. We can also close the panel as well and lock it in emergency situations. This here is a basic cell. You have a toilet and a sink combination, stainless steel. You have, you have a desk. You have a chair that moves in and out. They have a couple of cubby holes to keep their things in. They have a sprinkler system. 
Uh, we have hooks for the clothes. We have this area here for uh, storage. We got the window with the bars and the, and the, uh, the metal, metal grate. And this is how they open their window. And you have the two bunk beds. And that's it. Very small area for an inmate to live. They came from every corner of the country, from small towns and big cities. But they all shared one thing in common. They belonged to a family called Marines, a tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still, they come. Celebrate the 225-year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. This is the story about a group of kids who volunteered. Do something nice for someone. We fixed stuff. Did some art projects with the kids. We fixed up this house. We worked in the woods. Cleaned up the park. Did something for the planet. We just did it. No other reason. And you know what? It was great. At first, they didn't know each other. Well, that didn't last long. This guy is really funny. We ace are my new friends. Are you into it? Call 4-H or check out our website at areyouintoit.com. Kids aren't afraid of other kids. Or people with different color skin. That's because kids know there are other things. Worse things. Bigger things to be afraid of. Like monsters from outer space! Remember, friends come in all colors. Before you know it, she talks. Before you know it, she walks. Before you know it, she knows you. Before you know it, she has a heart. Before you know you're pregnant, when your baby's no bigger than a grain of rice. Before she's a twinkle in your eye, that's when you need to take folic acid every day. After that, it's too late to prevent some serious birth defects. Folic acid now, before you know it. And am I correct that the inmates that are housed here are free to come into this area and go back into their cells throughout the day? That's correct. Throughout the day, the, uh, they're basically out of their cells. They're able to watch TV. They're able to uh, play card games. They're able to go to programs. And obviously, they have their three meals a day as well. Um, but for the most part, depending if they're not uh, in their cells for disciplinary reasons, they're allowed to roam in and out of their cells. And I've only seen one guard on at, at this present time, is that correct? Each unit has two officers assigned to each unit, excuse me, two officers assigned to each unit. Um, however, if the, uh, one officer has to go to lunch or what have you, there'll be one officer on the floor um, for the most part. You, know, you have 120 inmates on the unit and the two officers are assigned to each block. Do you have problems, I mean, one officer or even two officers for 125 inmates that at times could be vicious? Yeah, we do have problems every so often, but for the most part, the inmates follow the rules, and the inmates know that if, if they are to act up or just, you know, violate the rules, that they'd go to segregation, which is like I call the jail inside the jail. Um, in addition to that, if they assault an officer, they know they're going to get more time added on to their sentence, and that's the last thing they want, especially in a county facility like this, where they're doing up to two and a half years. So the maximum sentence here would be two and a half years? Two and a half years, although they could have an on and after sentence where they go have two and a half and then for another charge, two and a half more. So we've had inmates do up to five to ten years here. In addition to that, we have pretrial inmates that they stay here for a certain amount of time before their trial, before their trial is, is completed and you know, they could go to jail. We've had inmates get life, life sentences that have been here for a couple of years before their trials can be completed. Jason, tell us a little bit about this red line that we see throughout the floor. The red line is meant for the inmates. The inmates are not allowed to cross the red line without the officer's permission, basically. As you can see over here, we have the officer's podium. The inmates are not allowed to cross that red line without the officer allowing them to cross that line to approach the desk. In addition to that, you get the red line that goes all the way around the unit, 
The inmates are not allowed to enter, enter any other inmates' cells aside from their own, so whenever they cross that red line, they're going into their own cell. If they do cross the red line, they're liable to be uh, in violation of the ru of unit rules, where the officer would then be disciplined them. They get a 24-hour lockup, which means they stay in their cell for 23 hour, 24 hours out of the day, where they get a 48-hour lockup as well. Right now we're in the inner facility of the jail itself. Uh, we get particular units as we get the 80 bed unit, the 60 bed unit, and then straight down where it says the F building, that's segregation, that's the 120 building. Right now, next to it, we've got the outside basketball courts. For inmates at, that have the privilege, they're able to go out and actually play basketball outside depending on the weather. If the weather's inclement, then they would use the gym, which is currently filled with inmates right now. But inside the gym, we have a basketball court, we have uh, Nautilus machines. We have no free weights at all within the facility. We used to, but then it was too much of a security risk, so we got rid of those. But like I said, this is the inside of the jail. The inmates can roam free. Well, not say roam free, we can roam this inner area when they go from unit to unit, or if they go to programs or what have you. Currently, we're in a cell in the 80-bed unit. The 80-bed unit is the substance abuse unit. Uh, it deals with drug and alcohol abuse. In order for an inmate to get to a unit like this, it's a privilege which means they have to do time in a general population unit. After they do time of good behavior, they can come to a unit like this We get rehabilitation. This is a great unit to be in. There's a lot more privileges. As you can see, we're in a cell right now. There's eight inmates to a room. It's like a dormitory style setting for inmates. Uh, there's no bars on the windows, and they can come as go, and there's no locks on the doors. However, the drawback to a unit like this is that they go to programs all day long and they have to be at the programs. And if they don't perform in the programs, then they'll be moved off the unit. Jerome, could you describe for us what a typical day in this, is, in this facility is like? Well, for the most part, some days it's real stressful. It's hard, you know, at times. Then, sometimes, you know, time flies, you have fun. But really, ain't nobody here for fun. You don't say we're all here. You don't say to better ourselves. Obviously, we made some wrong decisions in our lives that cost us our freedom taken away from our family, and that's what makes it hard sometimes. So the best thing to do here is while you're here, work the program, really get involved into it, dedicate yourself to it, you know, just put everything into it, man, because you don't put nothing into it, you really ain't going to get nothing out of it. You, you know, the sheriff told us that uh, most of the prisoners are here as a result of uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, do you find that you get some help with uh, those issues if, if they're present? Yeah, you can because, you know, it makes you aware of, like, what went wrong, you know what I'm saying, like, the decisions you made, like, the choice and everything, the streets you chose to walk down, you know what I'm saying? Like, make you aware of, like, your actions. Just, you know what I'm saying? Just talking about your problems makes it better, because sometimes a lot of people just hold their problems in. Like, people use for all different type of reasons, deaths in the family, they can't deal with life, you know, so basically they try to help you deal with that. It's not just, like, drugs. They also work on, like, your character, self-respect, you know, self-confidence things like that, and that's where it really comes in where you get the rehabilitation, because no matter what, you come to jail, you can't get rehabilitation, but if you want it. So you can come here and just sit here and fake it and don't get nothing, but you'll come back 20 times. You come here one time and you'll be really serious about it and dedicate yourself to it, I believe you won't have to come back to jail again. Are there particular steps that you've taken to try and ensure that you don't come back here again? Yes, yeah, like being um, honest, open, not being scared to talk, stand up in the meetings and talk sitting in the front row instead of the back row. You know, just like building certain characters, make sure my bed's made on time. Little things like that even help. Trying not to swear, trying not to get into altercation, trying to have an open mind about everything, be reasonable, you know, accepting things for what they are, not taking things as a gift or anything as a luxury, like anything owe me, if that anybody owe me anything. Uh, how much time do you have left to serve at this point? Right now, two years. Two more years. Are there things you're going to do during the next two years to try and improve your chances of making sure you don't end up here? Yes, yeah, like right now, um, I'm trying to go to a work lease and continue another program there. You know, just trying to build like a steady structure for myself, trying to work my way back to the community slowly but surely. You know, I'm not trying to just wrap up. You know, I'm trying to just, you know, just do program after program until I feel as though you know, I'm ready into society. Are there particular work skills that you've been able to develop or try to improve while you're here? Yes, yeah, like right now, I'm in um, HVAC and computer classes. Have those been have those been beneficial? Yeah, it's, it's educational and also gives you a chance to you know when you go home to get a job because you read the newspaper, everything says experience wanted. So therefore I have experience in HVAC. You computers. know, from from being on the outside, just having your freedom restricted temporarily is kind of disheartening to us. How do you deal with that, that someone's constantly controlling your movements for the next two years, really? You just gotta accept it and realize, you no, know, if you didn't want to be in a situation, you just never did what you did. 
know what I'm saying? Sometimes people in life, when they commit crimes, they need that, though. You no, know, if you get caught with a gun, you're not going to Disneyland for a year. So, you know what I'm saying? People got to understand that, though. You're going to jail. Currently, we're in the 60-bed unit. The 60-bed unit is the alternative to violence unit. When an inmate comes to this unit, basically they have, uh, they have uh, anger issues, where they have violence against women, violence against children. Uh, ju just like the 80-bed unit, for an inmate to come to this unit, it's a privilege, which means they have to do a certain amount of time on a general population unit of good behavior in order to come to a unit like this. Uh, they have more privileges on a unit like this, but once again, a drawback is they are in meetings all day to, for, for, for what have you, uh, safety reasons, uh, anger issues, what have you, and violence issues. So this is why they would come to a unit like this. Now, how common is it that we have an assault on, on a correction officer? It goes in spurts. Uh, you could have one during the whole month. You could have four or five in one week. It depends on the climate of the jail. When I say climate of the jail, I'm not talking about the weather. I'm talking about you could have gangs in conflict at one particular time. We have several gangs within the facility. We have the Latin Kings, the Latin Gangs of Disciples, and we have other smaller gangs. We have Nieta, which is a prison gang that was started out of Puerto Rico. Usually, generally, older Hispanic men are part of that gang. But as gangs go, sometimes the gangs are in conflict with each other. Sometimes the gangs have truces. When the gangs are in conflict with each other, we have a tendency to have more assaults on other inmates, assaults on staff, because if we have a fight on a unit and an officer attempts to break it up, a lot of times the inmates are not stopping and will get hit in, in, in an attempt to break up that situation. So it depends on the climate of the jail, depending on how many assaults on staff we may have. Now, what type of action is taken against a prisoner who assaults a correction officer? Well, they are charged in court. Uh, currently, we probably have about 125 cases pending in Salem District Court, which is our, our home court for this facility. And they will actually be charged assault on a correctional officer, which is actually a superior court charge. I, I, I believe that. It's a superior court charge, unlike assault on a police officer, which is a district court charge. And I don't understand the concept with that, but that's actually the way it's working right now. So in order to be charged with assault on a CO, you have to be indicted in superior court, I believe. Which in all likelihood carries with it a longer sentence as exactly. well. Exactly. Jason, what type of vocational training is offered to the inmates here at this facility? Well, currently, we have several types of training. We have HVAC. We have a print shop, which we're currently in right now. We're actually in the upper Volk building, where we have a lot of our technical uh, training that goes on within the facility it happens up in this building here. This here in the print shop, um, in addition we have the barber shop which you're going to see in the next building. But here in the print shop, we not only do we provide uh, printed material for this facility, we also provide printed material like for instance business cards for local police departments within the county. In addition to that, uh, for instance, I'm the director of a program called the Triad Program where I have all my printed material that I supply to the, the groups that I work with in each individual com community within the county. I supply them with all free material that we print here for that particular program. So we print a lot of material for within the county in, in addition to this facility alone. So we do a lot of art. This is a very busy department here. Now, and who's in charge of the print facility? We have Bill Sullivan and Tom Donovan who's right here. And uh, like I said, Tom's very busy. He supervises the inmates, makes sure they're doing, you know, do, getting all the work done and what have you. And you know, I'll let Tom briefly describe what goes on. Basically, basically what we do on the we do a lot of outside work. We do for schools, um, nonprofit organizations. We do a lot of in-house, as you can see. Uh, all these are forms that we use here, uh, and basically it gives them a structure, keeps them off the block, keeps them busy. It, it allows them to uh, earn some good time, and it also allows them to earn a, uh, learn a trade. How many uh, prisoners work here during a given week? Basically, we have five workers, and basically we have about seven students that come up in the morning. All we do is uh, we have a morning class, and then in the afternoon, basically what we do is we try to get the work uh, completed that has to go out. So the students come up in the morning, we teach them, uh, we have two presses here, we teach them on, on the other press. This here is our, our two color press. And what we do is uh, the workers continue to work and basically we just try to get the work done in the afternoons. Is the it the typical type of work day one would expect? You'd work uh, seven or eight hours on, on a given day? Uh, they work about six hours. The, the uh, workers come up and they work about six hours. Three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. Currently we're in the Upper Volk building, we're in the inmate barbershop where inmates get trained. 
In order to get properly trained in this, they need 1,000 hours of training. This program has been established for about four years now. If you look over here, we actually have two inmates getting their hair cut by two inmate workers here. In order to do a program like this, uh, once again, it's a privilege to be up here. So you need to do a certain amount of time with a general population unit, stay out of trouble, and you can come to a program like this and get the education you need. You know, Jason, for many of us, we say that we'd rather be dead than in a place like this. Um, I guess this is a suicide uh, cell. How many prisoners actually think or contemplate about suicide while in prison? Oh, quite a few. Matter of fact, um, this is, as you said, rather be dead. This is probably the worst situation you could possibly be in, in a jail as an inmate. When an inmate, whether he's joking or not, states that he wants to harm himself, we are obligated uh, by law, we have to uh, put them in restraints, put them in handcuffs, and bring them up here to the infirmary. Currently, as we are in the infirmary right now, currently we're in an at-risk cell, a suicide risk cell, as you would call it. Um, when they come into a cell like this, they're, they're classified as a P1 inmate, a precautionary one status inmate. And to be placed on it, all they have to say is, I want to hurt myself, I want to kill myself, or if they're slicing their wrists, slicing their necks, or, or hanging, or what have you. To come to a cell like this, they're stripped of all their clothing. All they have is the mattress, and they have a paper johnny. The light stays on 24 hours out of the day. And the only way they come off that status, a P1 status, is by somebody from mental health clearing them. I, as an officer, are not, do not have the authority to clear them in cases like that. Just mental health staff does. And, they, and then after that, either they can be sent back to their unit, or they can be on a P, P2 status, which means they'll get their uniform back and maybe get a blanket but they'll still remain in a cell like this. D despite those precautions, are any of them uh, successful at their suicide attempts? Oh, yes. Um, on many occasions, I've been here at the jail for eight years now. And in my eight years, I've found inmates hanging. I have, I've found inmates uh, cutting their necks, cutting their wrists, what have you. I myself have not had an inmate die on me. However, we have had a death here or two, one or two in the last few years, unfortunately. That's jail. You know, unfortunately, those things happen in a, an environment like this. Now, once they're released from this status, do they continue to get some type of psychiatric care after this event? It depends. It depends on the, the type of needs that that inmate need, that might, may need. I mean, an inmate could actually just joke and say he might want to harm himself. And I've been in situations like that where an inmate has just said, oh, I'm, I'm jokingly, I'm going to kill myself. Well, I can't determine whether he's joking or not, and that's when I have to put the handcuffs on him and bring him up to the infirmary. Now, in a situation like that, the inmate probably doesn't need any more mental health uh, therapy. But in situations where we actually have found inmates trying to harm themselves, uh, that's when they may need more therapy down the road. And so it varies. It depends on the particular situation. The infirmary deals with mental health employment, mental health appointments, uh, dentistry, in addition to medical, obviously. So everything is done for as inmates' care and needs is done here in the infirmary. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad you could take a look at prison life, thankfully from a distance, and I hope you enjoyed our show. Join us next time for Massachusetts School of Law's Educational Forum's presentation of A Question of Law.